The British paratroopers would normally wear the same boots and anklets as the ordinary soldiers, and they'd also wear battle dress, jacket and trousers. But sometimes the paratroopers were issued with special trousers, and the map pocket would be gusseted so we'd all more paperwork. But they're extremely rare and, I, and, I don't, and expensive, so I don't have a pair of those. These are just the ordinary battle dress trousers on this one. When the parachute regiment was first formed, they used to wear a step-in over smocking, plain green material. But I don't think that ever went into active service. Shortly afterwards, they, they came up with this. This is called a Denison smock. It was different types. This is a half sip on the early ones, and they had the knitted cuffs in a camouflage colour. Now, this chap's armed with a, a Sten machine gun. This is a Mark II Sten machine gun. This particular one is actually a replica. Now, my friend Mike, he's been in the army for years, and when I showed him this, he couldn't believe it was a replica. He kept kept looking at it and dry, fi dry firing it. He just he couldn't believe it. It was actually a replica. It's just like the originals. And then the magazines for these, they wouldn't fit in the the normal basic pouches that the ordinary infantry wore, so they had to have special pouches. And what they did, there was some quite a lot of leftover ammunition pouches for the Lanchester machine gun which are very tall so they, they cut them down and put the lids down in a, bit of, in a different place and then they would wear a scrim scarf around the neck that was really for putting over the helmet and, and hanging over the face to, to disguise themselves but quite often they just wear it around the neck and then they've got the helmets this is an early type it has the leather chin strap later on in the war they would change the leather to just cotton webbing Inside the pouches are three compartments. I've only got a piece of wood in there because I haven't got enough Stengum magazines. And this one's dated 1942. And also, the paratroopers will wear their, their winged badge on the sleeve. But this chap, he's got his stitched on the inside of the pocket. So, that's the thing. Whenever you buy any surplus uniforms, always look in the pockets because you never know what you're going to find. Now the way the chin cup is fastened to the helmet, there are two metal rings at the side and that thin leather strap, it goes through both rings, then back through one and then just pulls tight and that's how it's held in position. They did come up with a special bayonet for the Sten gun, that's one at the side there. And then they would quite often carry a toggle rope. And what that, that with that they could link several together to make a longer rope if they're going to climb up a cliff or over a wall or something. As the war went on, they found that the handle for the entrenching tool would quite often slide out of those loops at the back. So midway through the war, they put an extra strap on across the end of the handle to stop it sliding out. It would come really useful for paratroopers in particular when they're jumping out of aircraft. The case on this one, this is dated 1943. Then also later in the war, instead of having a cradle for the water canteen, they came up with these like a one piece carrier for the canteen that, just, that the canteen just slipped into. At the start of the war, Britain had no submachine guns at all. None of them had ever been developed. And they did have a few Thompsons, but they were really expensive to make and took a long time to make. So they had to come up with something pretty quick. And two guys called Shepherd and Turpin, they came up with this idea. And that's how the Sten gun gets its name. It's the initials of the two men, the S and T. Now the EN is for Enfield, where they were made. It was, uh, had a range of about 200 feet, just fired pistol ammunition. And they came into production in 1941 and went on into 1960. Like I said, this is a replica, but it's got the marks there, Sten. And also on this, you can 
Oh, well. It dry fires just like the original. And it, is a, it is a good copy, but it is a, it is a replica. This is the bayonet. This is another replica. Well, there wasn't one of, many of those made anyway, so it'd be hard to find one of those. And that's quite simple. It just fits on the barrel like that, and then that the cl just clips into one of the holes in the in the gun there, like that. On the drop, the British paratroopers would wear this plain green oversmock. That was just to stop the strings of the parachute getting tangled in their equipment. When they landed, they would just take that off and throw it away. Now the parachute, that's an X-type. This particular one is a, a post-war example, but it was just the same, only the wartime ones would have white straps. Now, the parachute regiments were formed under the orders of Winston Churchill in 1940, and the parachute training school was set up in June of that year at Manchester's Ringway Airport. But they found that there wasn't much space there, but next to the airport was Tatton Hall and Park, and that was owned by Baron Edgerton. He was a keen aviator and he'd been friends with the Wright brothers and he offered the grounds of his parkland as a landing zone and during the war over 60,000 men and women trained there. And although it wasn't a war zone, 46 people were killed there and lots more injured. And there were a few famous people trained there. One of them was Evelyn War. He was in the SOE, that's the Special Operations Executive. They were dropped down behind into occupied Europe to help with the resistance and bring back important, important information. But on his training, he broke his leg on his second drop, so spent uh, a lot of time behind a desk. And it was during that time that he wrote the book Brideshead Revisited. And it is rumoured that he got the inspiration for Brideshead Hall from Tatton Hall. And another famous person there was Odette Hallows. She was a French lady. She was dropped into France to help with the resistance, but she was she was also in the SOE, and but she was captured in 1943 along with her husband Peter Churchill, and no doubt they would have been tortured and interrogated by the Germans, and then she spent the rest of the war in Ravensbrück concentration camp, but she did survive the war, and after that she was awarded the George Cross, the MBE, and the Legion d'Honneur for all her services to the war effort. And she only died in 1995, aged 82. But not all airborne troops were dropped in by parachute. Some were, some would use gliders. And one of the most famous glider operations was the attack on Bonneville Bridge over the Khan Canal, and it was later known as Pegasus Bridge. On the night of the 5th of June, 1944, in the cover of darkness, the day before D-Day, the airborne troops set off in their gliders and just using the reflection of the moonlight on the canal and the compass. They managed to find their way to the bridge and they landed just 47 yards away. An amazing feat that was. And they took the Germans completely by surprise and they took the bridge in less than 15 minutes and they held on until help arrived. And then the original bridge in 1994 was replaced by a new one and the old bridge was moved to Ranville and where there's, a, where there's a museum now. The bridge is still there and there's, and there's a museum as well. And the famous actor Richard Todd, he was there on that day, he landed on that night on the Pegasus Bridge and went over Pegasus Bridge. And on the 65th anniversary of D-Day, myself, my brother-in-law, another chap, we went to Normandy and we were at Pegasus Bridge at the museum there and there was lots of veterans there. And one of the old guys there, he was talking to the crowd and he was telling them what happened on that night. And he was saying, telling us how, he was, as he was rushing across the bridge, he got shot in the arm and just casually said that, oh, well, I just kept on going and I patched it up later. That's the kind of men they were in those days. And if you go to Tatton Park today, there's a memorial there to the airborne troops. That was unveiled in 1973 and it looks out onto the parkland where the landing zone was. I'm here today at Tatton Park and this is the memorial to the parachute troops. And a nice sunny day. You look around, that's my other half, that were two dogs. And up there you can, and you, can uh, you can see that plane coming down 
landing at Manchester Airport just over the, over the horizon there. Just loads and loads of space. Perfect conditions for training. The American paratroopers would wear these tall leather brown boots, very popular, very sought after. And then quite often they would have a, a fighting knife strapped to the leg, or in this case this is a bayonet for the M1 carbine. Now the trousers that the paratroopers wore had big pockets at the side, and these just full of bits of equipment. And because the paratroopers were really well trained and really tough fighters, the Germans give them the nickname the, the butchers in baggy trousers. Now, during the Second World War, most paratrooper boots were made by the Corcoran Company. Uh, but I'm not sure about these. They've got the that's, that slope there. That's uh, so, you know, they, they don't catch the, snag the boots on anything when they're jumping out of the aeroplane. It's got the, the stitch in there. That's that's like it should have. And the toe caps. This is an actual extra piece of leather on the top. Not just That's not just a pattern. They're rock hard. And it's got 12 lace holes. And what I can... What I can Understand up to now, the Corcoran boots did have 12 lace holes, but later on after the war, uh, the Dutch army and others, they, they had paratrooper boots as well, look very similar, but they only have 11 lace holes. And this one, it's also got the extra stitching back up, back of the heel. So, but the only thing wrong with these, it's the soles. They're not like they should be, if they have to be American Corcoran boots. They should be, that bit, that rubber bit should be stitched onto there should be leather there, so I don't know. There's nails in the in the soles though, like the Corcoran ones should have. So I don't know, don't know what they are. But I, I don't think the Dutch ones. Like I can say, the Dutch ones, of what I can see, have eleven lace holes. These have got twelve. So I don't know, don't know what they are really. The paratroopers would carry the T-handle entrenching tool like the ordinary infantry. Sometimes they would be issued with a one with a shortened wooden handle, but I don't have one of those. They're very rare. But you, you see a lot of photographs of them with the the, you know, the usual long handle on. Then the three pouches on the left hand side, they're for grenades. Then they would wear a compass around the wrist. That would be very handy. And then round the waist, they'd have the ten pouch magazine belt just like the ordinary infantry and this chap he's carrying an M1 carbine but with a folding stock they were specially made for the paratroopers so they wouldn't take up as much space when they're jumping out of the aircraft now the jacket and the trousers they are original but they're they're quite unique to the to the paratroopers if anybody's seen the program band of brothers you, you know you can see that in there it was very very popular and it's the they're quite rare now because uh, by the end, by the time the end of the war came, they changed that just the ordinary standard M43 jacket like the ordinary soldiers would wear. Now the M1 carbine, like I say, it's got a folding stock. This just opens out like that. Then it's, you know, like you can use it like a ordinary rifle. But they weren't very popular because the ammunition wasn't very powerful. I mean, most paratroopers, when they landed, they would exchange that and try and find a Garand if they could. Now, according to Ian McCollum from the Forgotten Weapons, 
YouTube channel. He said a lot of these are not actually original. A lot of them are like the woodwork and the, the stocks were replaced. And, and he told me what to look out for. And I think that is a replacement. It's not actually real, but the woodwork, it's got a number on there. But these were only made by the Inland Company. And if, if the stock isn't stamped Inland, it's not an original one. Now, if you look under, you can't, you can't see it properly, but just underneath the site, there is the markings for the Inland Company. So the receiver is original. And the woodwork could be, but I know this isn't because under there there should be some numbers, some stock numbers stamped into, well, it, stamped into the metal and there's nothing on there. So I'm not sure. I mean, it, it could be a you know, replacement timber and stock. I'm not sure, but it just looks, it looks all right anyway. Then the, uh, they would wear the standard M1 steel helmet, only they would have a special liner and a special leather chin cup for extra stability when they jumping out of the aircraft. All soldiers would carry the two-piece water canteen, that's in its canvas case, on the left-hand side. Then on the right-hand side, that's a, a field dressing pouch. Then the, the paratroopers would have a special backpack, that's called a musset bag. The straps on the musset bag, they would come over the shoulder like that and they, had a, they have a hook on there and that fastens to the ring that's fastened onto the shoulder straps. Like the British parachute forces, the Americans were only formed in 1940. And just like the British, on the night of June the 5th, 1944, under cover of darkness, 13,400 men of the 101st and 82nd Airborne Division set off under the cover of darkness to land in behind enemy lines in France to take key towns and road junctions. That was to try and stop the Germans reinforcing the beaches when the, when the, uh, the main uh, landing started. But on the way over, the, the aircraft ran into a lot of cloud and when the men were dropped, a lot of them were dropped miles away from where they should have been or some got lost and the, the regiments got mixed up. If you ever watch the TV series Band of Brothers, it tells you all about that. It's a really good series, it's really realistic, and all the characters in that program were actually real people who landed on that day. And one of the main objectives that night was a little French town called St. Mary Glise. And an American paratrooper called John Steele, as he was coming down, he got hit by shrapnel, it hit him in the foot, and he was wounded. And coming down, he managed to get tangled into the roof of the church and he got he was stranded there he did try and cut himself down with his knife but the knife slipped out of his hand and so he just stuck there and he was there for three hours before the germans spotted him and then they cut him down and he was taken prisoner but four days later he managed to escape back to the uk and when he recovered he went back to fight again and he did take part in operation market garden he only died in 1969 and if you ever go to St Mary Glees today there's a fantastic museum there and they, they also they have a, a dummy of John Steele, American parish who are hanging from the church roof even today. It's a very important event.